Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the 10 o'clock block here on a given Monday morning. We're talking about the middle way uh, with Chang Wang and uh, Alexander Morawa. And uh, our title for the show today is Teaching Young People Globally, Part One. This is not without its complexities. So I'm going to ask Chang to both introduce, introduce both the subject uh, and our special guest, Alexander Morawa. Uh, Chang, good morning and thank you for doing that. Good morning, Jay, and good morning, Dr. Morava. It, it's going to be a, a very interesting topic for us to discuss this morning. And we di uh, divided this topic into two parts. So today, Professor Morava and I will share our observations and reflections on teaching young people globally. Then two weeks uh, later, Russell Liu and Professor David Larson will share their observations and comments. So today's topic is teaching young people globally. Dr. Morava has been a law professor for decades. He spent more than 10 years in Lucerne, Switzerland, and chairing the Anglo-American Law Department and uh, uh, leading the international efforts at uh, University of Lucerne Law School. And after he immigrant to the United States. He has been actively teaching at uh, American University Washington College of Law and also a, a law school in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and most recently at the China University of Political Science Law in Beijing. So in this regard, Professor Morava is also not only an international law, professor, but also international law scholar and counsel, but also a law professor by definition. Uh, for myself, I've been a law professor since 2006. I've been teaching in at the University of Minnesota Law School and two other law schools in the United States, two law schools in China. I had the privilege to work with Professor Marava in Lucerne for many, many years and also had the opportunity to travel to University of Vienna and Australia, Austria, and uh, also uh, Brazil, as in Paulo, Brazil. So both of us spent many, many years teaching young people and most, most of our students are law students. So I think it would be beneficial for us to just take this opportunity to share our observations. We've been, so we can start with what we see from the young people in different countries. So we had the privilege to work with the young people in China, in Asia, in Korea, in Australia, then in many countries in Europe, particularly Switzerland, Austria, uh, Italy, and uh, Brazil. So are these the same? Their their their, gen, their age, uh, roughly the same. You know, uh, upper undergraduate students to uh, upper graduate students, law students. So somewhere between between 20, uh, 22, 23 to twenty six, twenty seven. But just think, but now think about we have been teaching. Um, about two decades. So that means we've been teaching gen both generation millennials and also the Zoomers. So generation uh, Y and generation Z. So that's the background of our uh, discussion. Okay, let me, ask you, let me ask you a very unfair question, uh, Alexander. Um, you know, if you, if you hang around for a few years, like both of you gentlemen have done, uh, as uh, uh, Chang indicated, you have multiple generations, and so uh, you can you can see them pass through your classrooms, and and you can observe how one generation differs from the next. Uh, and it's hard to characterize, and it's certainly hard to make generalizations for, with multinational, multi-nation of generations. But let me ask you an unfair question: Can you characterize for me the generation now? What is it? What is the essence of this generation? How does it differ from earlier generations that have passed through your classroom? 
I don't think it's an unfair question. It's just a little difficult to answer with any meaningful uh, substantive answer. What I think there is a pro and a con to the current generation. Uh, the pro is a very, very strong level of being inquisitive, being open-minded, being just going everywhere basically for knowledge, not just listening and following to what is presented to students. I think they're, they're willing to do much more than one would normally require. Also, they come with a, a larger uh, backpack of experiences in a way than, than previous generations have. Uh, the, the con, in my opinion, is that many are a little bit more consumers and consumer oriented than actually active participants. And that certainly comes out of the internet and, and, and social media generation that we have right now. Uh, everybody's a publisher, everybody is a singer, everybody's a, a little mini version of a pop star in a way on YouTube and, and, and TikTok. Uh, but everybody also consumes probably a little bit too uncritically and too, too willing, too, with too much willingness to treat thing as, uh, things as authentic that actually are not. Uh, when you specifically talk about law school, that's crucial. I mean, the difference gets blurred between an authentic decision of an international court of justice uh, judgment uh, and the opinion of some YouTuber who also has an opinion on, on what international sovereignty means. That's maybe a, a brief characterization. Well, let me go one step further and, and say, you know, the test to me, maybe it's subjective, uh, of the value of a given generation is whether they are good citizens. And I don't mean citizens in a nationalistic environment. I, I'd say rather citizens of the world, uh, whether they understand the issues that go beyond their daily lives. Um, and could you talk about that? Uh, how is this generation fitted uh, to be good citizens? Yeah, the question is, is, what is good? Is it compliant or is it, is it politically critical? Is it compliant? Politically in the sense let, me, let me refine that. Politically critical. <laughs> compliant, we don't need compliance. You, you don't necessarily referring to a, a good citizen who follows the rules, right? Which partly we teach in law school. I mean, this, this is part of what we educate people in how to follow the rules, but also how to apply the rules creatively and to make sure that you do your best for your client, but also in a way the best for society. So that's part of the teaching program for sure. Uh, let me say something that actually goes back to your previous question because I didn't quite answer that fully. In the class I currently teach at American University, it's an LLM program. It has students who come from all backgrounds, nationalities, continents. Right now we have students from pretty much every single continent. And some of them are recent grads. Some of them are retired judges and, and, and uh, practicing lawyers. When you put all these generations in a way in one classroom together, you see how really creatively um, purposeful that is and how it crosses borders, which we would not be able to cross even have, if we had every single nation, but everybody off the same generation in one classroom. So I think that's another crossing boundaries that I believe is very crucial in education generally. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Tang, let me go to you. You know, one thing I became aware of uh, 20 years ago was that uh, Chinese uh, lawyers, anyway, were always uh, out and about around the world, taking master's degrees, what have you, in every, every kind of university in, in every country. And, and to hear Alexander speak about the, you know, the, uh, the international quality of education, at least in the law schools now, makes me think that the future, if we are to achieve a responsible generation, is actually in cross-training internationally. Uh, not to limit it to lawyers, but to have have kids, students go everywhere and have them get, take a little bite of this and that and the other thing all around the world. You know, and in an ideal world, we can do that. Uh, what do you think? Is it worth it? Let me first respond to your question, then I will share something else. So uh, in terms of study abroad, American students have very, very limited experience in studying abroad. There's a very, not a lot of opportunities that have been provided to American students, even has been provided to some elite university and colleges, not all the students take that advantage. But in my opinion, we should make study abroad to, to study somewhere outside, outside your comfort zone for six months or one month, or one year, mandatory. Mandatory in order to train global citizens and uh, train the young talent to be able to cope with the uh, internet globalization. 
that and also open our minds. There's a uh, increasingly American students are feeling uh, behind uh, compared to the European students and the Asian students. Now let's go to the A Asian countries. I've been uh, interacting with the Chinese students and the Korean students a lot. Every single one of them, you can call them globalist, and uh, but at the same time nationalist. Why is it called a globalist? Because every single one of them, there is, there is a eager for, for a knowledge, and particularly for the most advanced international knowledge, either in the law, in STEM, or in finance. But also, uh, and, and at the same time, the vast majority of them, I would, I would not say all of them, but the vast majority of them are proudly nationalistic. And they have a total confidence in their own system, political system or judicial system. They don't think they are coming, go, they need to go to America, go to Europe and to learn everything and then come back to their own country to change their own country. No, they don't think so. They think they can, they need to broaden their horizon and just seek uh, 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 potential opportunities, but they are not coming here to be a student. Then, there's something else I want to share with you. At almost each of my class, particularly the law class, I, I do a quick survey of the entire class, no matter how big, how small, this class could be as small as 12, you know, 15 students for a seminar, could be as big as 50 or 60 students for lecture. I do a survey, the quest, there are two questions on the survey. Question one is, do you agree or disagree with the following statement. The statement is Western liberal democracy has failed. Western liberal democracy has failed. Then the question, the second question on the survey is, it is important to me to live in a democracy. Again, it is important to me to live in a democracy. So for our generation, you know, I think that Everybody have some. We 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 probably reach a consensus. Liberal democracy has in, uh, have a crisis, but the, the, has not failed. We show the resilience, and uh, there are some self-correcting ability, and we put our confidence in. And it is uh, important to our generation to live in a democracy. And surprisingly, not young people, not all the young people think that way. And my result from the different survey from the different country, different classes are too mixed to be generalized. Generalization would be a crime. But what I can see a common trend is European students are unique. They are highly idealistic, highly globalized. And my European classes are in, at Lucerne, and in Vienna, there are students from all over Europe and uh, from all over the world. And the vast majority of them still believe democracy is important. Well, Ale Alexander, let me make you a student for a moment. Don't you think every teacher should see himself as a student? Um, do you believe that uh, liberal democracy is, has succeeded, has failed? or is succeeding, is, is on the upswing, or is it failing over time? Isn't it succeeding because of its failures? In many ways, in whatever you can, words you want to use. <laughs> you can only succeed if you're challenged, right? So a challenge is a good thing for liberal democracy. It's set up to be challenged, consistently challenged, also legally challenged. Uh, there's many democracies that constantly undergo constitutional changes, sometimes revolutionary, sometimes evolutionary. And, and we lawyers can live with that, right? It's fine to change your system if you change it in an orderly fashion. Storming the capital of a, build, of a, of a nation is not part of that. So that would be, if that goes on, it's, it's a complete failure for sure. Uh, can it go back to functioning quite well? I think it can many times because of the challenges that we are facing here. So I would absolutely agree that we still live in a liberal democracy. I also absolutely second what uh, Jung was just saying here. Uh, globalization has to be a part of the curriculum, not just law school, but before that. 
I'm, I, I noticed sometimes that uh, you know college level education is many times much more global minded than law school. Law school we tackle from exactly the wrong end. We bring them to class and teach them American contract law or Belgian contract law uh, or you know Israeli constitutional law. We don't teach them what is a contract. Once we start talking about that, we notice that the Chinese people think a contract is by and large the same thing as an American and a Brazilian would think. 90% is the same thing. Negotiating, coming to an agreement and putting it in legal terms that everybody can understand and comply with, right? But we spend four years teaching people how to think nationally and then we throw in one course about international law where they're dragged out of this mindset and they're being kind of forced to do something that's uncomfortable, right? You, you have to have both. Earth. You have to have both. You want both, both, both the national and the international. Or can we say, can we say at this point it might be more valuable to have the global right up front? You should start with the global everything. You should spend the first two years in law school studying global concepts of the law, and you would identify so many similarities. Right? Look at conflict resolution. Concepts of conflict resolution now have the same parameters anywhere in the world. They didn't have very many different manifestations. But if you learn only the way we do it in the United States, we even develop a US approach to what mediation is. And we talk to somebody in Indonesia who does mediation quite effectively. Their concept is very different. And we don't have the common language to actually get what they're talking about. So I would say go global first and then go back to, uh, this contradicts whatever the bar, American Bar Association says, because we need to train professionals, right? That's, that's also a legitimate um, outcome of legal education. And now if you go global, Alexander, you, you find that there's um, inherent racism in some countries. And, I, and I, I guess I speak mostly about the US from my, my observation, uh, where uh, there's, there's racism there. So there's a barrier to, to global understanding. And you have got to sort of pull that racism out. You've got to dampen that racism. You've got to teach people not to entertain racism you know, in their personal development. Um, so in the course of teaching, teaching law or teaching anything, how do you do that? Because they, they come from a, a home, a community, which includes racism. How do you fix that? Fixing is not possible. Trying to get them to start thinking differently is. I mean, there's there's two different kinds of racism. One is probably smaller in numbers. That's the outright uh, obvious racism that you see in you know all kinds of symbolism, all kinds of language, all kinds of speech. And then there's the underlying uh, racism that people many times don't identify as racism themselves. They just believe it's something that is cultural, and their culture just is including those kind of preconceived understandings of the others, right? Othering is the new word that everybody uses in this respect. So I think that the blatant one is easy. I mean, if you're a Nazi nowadays in Germany, you will actually most likely be arrested and put in prison because it's not lawful to be that kind of racist. If your underlying emphasis of, of priority of your own race is doesn't come to the surface in these outbursts that can be sanctioned by the society, but is sort of a, an underlying determinant for all your actions, that is a lot more difficult to challenge. In, in education, I believe what you have to do is just bring out the racism when it comes out and talk about it, right? Lawyers are supposed to justify the outcome of their decision-making process. If you challenge a student who has racist tendencies to explain and legitimize and justify those tendencies, they get in trouble quite quickly because it's difficult to justify. Hey, that must be a challenge for some of them because they're going to be hard to turn. Uh, but, but Chang, I want to ask you a question. This is also an unfair question. Sorry. You know, it seems to me, just reacting to the title, <clears throat> Teaching Young People, is, uh, is this, <clears throat> you know, here on Think Tech, we challenge the young people. We say, look, we, we have a problem. We have this problem, that problem, that problem. In our society today, we spend a lot of time talking about these problems. Uh, we don't necessarily come to any conclusion. And if we do come to a conclusion, we have a lot of, we have a lot of difficulty in implementing that conclusion, turning into action so as to improve that problem. And then we say to them, these young people, we say, it's up to you. You're the next generation. We look to you. We're too old. 
we're over the hill. You can't count on us to fixing it because we haven't fixed it yet. But we are counting on you. That is really unfair to tell a young person that, as far as I'm concerned. But, but query, <clears throat> is that true now? And we count on this generation that you gentlemen are talking about, the generation now, the generation um, you know, that you're teaching uh, to fix things for us, to make a better world, to take it further than we ever took it. It is, it is a very fair question, but it's a very difficult question to, to answer. Let, let me start a, a slightly different perspective. Everything we can, everything we teach in law school to the young kids are not directly related to their future career in law practice. And so what do they really need to survive in law practice? They cannot directly obtain from in classroom. So what we can teach them is I basically look at two things, what, how we can nurture a continued intellectual curiosity and to have these young people to understand, to be aware that learning is a lifelong process, it's a continuing process. There is nothing you can eat a formula you can obtain and be successful. Secondly, how we can ensure people continue to be a critical thinker beyond the college. So in, in college classroom, we ask people to argue, right? To jump side, to, to challenge each other, to challenge themselves, to be a critical thinker. But people quickly forget about it after graduation. I remember one uh, one of my uh, college professor, and when we graduate, he said, I have only one uh, wish to all of you. So when you graduate, every single year after your graduation, read one meaningful book, all completely out of cur intellectual curiosity, but nothing else, not related to your work, not financial advice, not how the stock market manipulation, but just uh, one philosophical or scientific book completely out of intellectual curiosity. Can you do that? All of us said, of course we can. Then 20 years later, when we call it reunion, very few of us did. You know, can say that after 20 years, I read, I have read 20 book, good, very, very good books. So back to your question, it is, we, on the one hand, we cannot count on young people and to, to save the system. On the other hand, uh, that, that's unfair to them. But I have tremendous confidence in the young people. I think the young people, I, I do hope that we will, first of all, I hope there are more female world leaders run the country. Second, I hope there are more young world leaders run, run, the, run, the, United, run the countries. That will, the world will be much better shape. You will have a more uh, young people. Uh, I'm not referring to Justin Trudeau uh, or you know these world leader, existing world leaders, but uh, from what I see from the younger generation, they are much more open-minded and they are much more uh, idealistic. Uh, they might change when they get to our age, but uh, at least, uh, this time that in last year, a few months ago, the, the reason we had 2020 election and because the young people showed their commitments. And so that is my, not the direct answer to your question, but uh, I have to, uh, to show my uh, uh, optimism in this regard. I really have tremendous confidence and uh, hope in the younger generation. Alexander, what would you uh, what would you add to that? I'm sure you have thoughts about that. Well, I, I I think Jang for bringing in the gender dimension here because I think the diversity that we're looking at in the future will be racial and ethnic, will be cultural, will be linguistic, but it will to a very large degree also be a gender equal approach where you know women will make up at some point the majority of the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. There's no doubt about it. It's just going to happen. Uh, once we're there, I think things will change. If you look at the makeup of the European Court of Human Rights, for instance, which is a quite influential tribunal in Europe, it is 
pretty much uh, gender equal already at this point in time. And many of the judges joining there are the younger generation of judges who bring in this enthusiasm, I believe, that, that Jung was pointing out. I also believe all these uh, lawyers of the future will, whether we actively promote it as professors or not, they will be growing up in a much more integrated global society, simply because what they encounter will be global. They cannot avoid it, even if they are, somebody said, nationalistic a little bit in their mindset. That still doesn't mean they can avoid uh, realizing that it's an integrated society. Do commercial law nowadays uh, and do it nationally only. Good luck. Right. But I, don't, I don't know why it disconnects for me, but uh, last night on 60 Minutes, uh, one of the segments there, they, all of the segments were very disturbing. It was a very interesting show. One of them was uh, Asher Assad, Bashar Assad in Syria, and how he has been doing atrocities on his own people for years. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, horrible atrocities, even to young children, torture. And this evidence of this. And, you know, you, you would think that this would go before the International Court of Criminal, Criminal Justice in, in The Hague, um, which is not necessarily connected with the United Nations, as I understand it. Um, and uh, so various um, uh, organizations, human rights organizations, have asked that this be taken up by the International Court of Criminal Justice. Um, but it has been vetoed by both China and Russia. And so um, uh, Assad has been getting away with it for years. And the torture and the, and the chemical weapons continue. And it, it's extraordinary. And I, and I really wonder, I mean, you know, if, if, a world, if the world was really conscious, right? conscious and conscious, if this generation we're talking about were really aware you know, of the, the morality involved and the facts on the ground, they would, it wouldn't be compliance, it would be activism. And they would say, wait a minute, this must be addressed. Um, will this generation coming up, are they being trained to, are they being sensitive about taking this sort of thing up and not letting it happen? John, you wanna take it up first? I, I think you should take it up first. <laughs> well, bear in mind, we all, and this is a loyally approach, I'll, I'll, I'll apologize for that. We all live with a big gigantic dinosaur in our backyard, which we sometimes think is a little puppy. And that's the Westphalian system of governance. We still live in a concept of how the world is run that comes out of the 16th century, namely monotonous uh, and, and uh, integrated nation states of sorts, right? So when we talk about uh, Syria and other conflict areas, we're facing a new geopolitical reality where we're kind of slowly moving back to a kind of Cold War-ish situation with the, the massive difference that it's not just two players anymore. There are multiple additional players coming in. If you look at China, of course, being one of the most prominent one, go, go regional and you have in the vicinity of Syria, you have Turkey that flexes its muscle in many ways you have was the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is a massive regional player, right? So you have not just one big global war, sort of red versus blue, uh, US versus USSR that's governed us for 40 years. Now we have multiple scenarios where different kind of cold wars are playing out. And those freeze everything because of, you mentioned the word veto, because we have these strong players being able to say no to it. When I teach my human rights course, we, we always hit the edge of enforcement. What, what does it mean if we get a judgment from a court saying this wasn't right, if the state then doesn't comply and there is no international army to go in and enforce it, right? Uh, and I say, yes, that's absolutely true. We're lacking there. But think about the United States for a moment. If the United States Supreme Court issues a decision and the president says, I'm not going to enforce it, where is the Supreme Court's army, right? It's a system that's just different. Our constitutional system is a little bit more integrated. We understand that we'll burst it at the seams if we constantly non-comply. Uh, the international system allows non-compliance to exist. And that's frustrating for students many times. So they absolutely echo what you were pointing out in your question. I'm sure. Okay, you want to weigh in on that question? Yes, I, the reason I have confidence and being up in the young people and being optimistic about the future is 
even the uh, different race, different religion, different even different generation. Uh, Alexander has uh, been working with in the different countries, and there is a something strikingly like a common feature we can see from the younger generation is they have common sense. They have a common sense. The, the by saying common sense, I mean the global change, the global climate change is real. Green New Deal makes perfect sense. You know, uh, banks must be regulated. And a lob lobbying is uh, a horrible idea. The uh, government need to take care of uh, the education and healthcare should not be pro for profit. No matter where the students are, students from Europe, from Asia, from United States, they all they share extremely similar common sense. And then, what's really striking is they just uh, you know whatever some questions still being debated. In in the on CNN or uh, in, in the government in Congress, there is no debate in, in the younger generation. The United States is a racist country, and we need to change that. The, uh, the state government in Texas is a carcistocracy, and we need to change that. It's, it's government by the least competent, and the least ethical, and the least qualified people to run. And some, at some point in the past four years, some agencies in our federal government became that. And glad, thank God, you know, we are fortunate to be able to, to not slip into a carcistocracy forever. But young people, no matter where they are in the United, you know, American college, uh, college classroom in, in Europe, they all share things, you know, of course that it's very bad damage to American reputation when the European students came look at what's happening in the United States. But uh, there is a common sense. There is a common sense generation. There is a very little uh, uh, BS in the, what the controversy, you know, you know, uh, the gun control, don't take away my second amendment. These kind of BS, the young people don't buy any sense of that. That's why I have confidence in the younger generation. You know, Alexander, uh, we, had, we had a show uh, oh, a few years ago where one of the lawyers who had been practicing a long time, he said he had a, he had a problem with the legal, the legal educational system in this country. He said, um, you know, they have law review uh, uh, notes and so forth, um, you know, uh, educating you about what particular decision or a series of decisions uh, has been, um, tracking on where the precedent is going, um, but they do not look at the precedent in terms of good public policy, uh, generally speaking. They, they, they respect the president, precedent perhaps too much um, and they don't criticize it. They don't criticize, and I don't mean calling judges names or encouraging people to attack them. That was also in 60 Minutes. Um, but you know, uh, they should take issue with the decision that is bad in the, in the contextual view of that decision as against our world today. Um, and, you know, it, it, it opens the question of whether we do have critical thinking about what our institutions are doing. If a bill is a bad bill, let's, let's hear from the law students and the law reviews and the lawyers, many of whom just put their green eye shades on as soon as they enter practice and never participate in public issues. Um, the, do you think we need a change in the way lawyers are trained uh, so that they, they take the context and they speak out on things in law school and after? Yep, absolutely. I mean, if you come to one of my classes, you will see I will not pe let people slip by who are unwilling to second guess and analyze judicial decisions, statutes, international treaties based on questions of public policy. And if you will, the, the global um, effect of those, right? I mean, if a, if a court in a, in a powerful country issues a decision, it has consequences abroad. So I think it's crucial uh, that if we as professors do that, whether we do it well or not, is a different question that we, we emphasize and encourage that kind of criticism. But throughout, I mean, once you're in the professional world, once you're done with law school, you need to keep that up. And that's a challenge, not so much for university, but it's a challenge for legal employers actually to make sure that people can continue to educate themselves 
and can have time in their busy schedule not to just go from one probit case to the next or you know file one patent after the other but to actually become well-rounded individuals who kind of second guess what what's going on in many ways right that that's you know, true in every profession but particularly bear in mind most societal conflicts at some point end up in a court of law or in a legislative body right so and and these are tend to be staffed by lawyers. So we are the ones who ultimately make decisions in areas like medicine and climate change where we quite frankly have not the slightest idea what we're talking about, but we still need to make decisions in those areas. So we need to open our minds to let others explain to us what the problem is and what the bigger impact is. Yeah, who is better qualified to speak about such things, about government and policy, direction of countries and continents? Uh, so we're almost out of time here, Alexander. I'd like to offer you an opportunity to, to provide a takeaway to people. What would you like to leave with them about this discussion? I would leave to, leave to the audience every single word that uh, Jung has said, actually, because his optimism and, and encouragement is just unparalleled. And it comes from a tremendous experience in teaching. He was one of my most beloved guests when he was in, in Switzerland to teach courses there and he still is. Uh, let's be optimistic. Can I say that? Let's be optimistic that within growing generations of young people and law students, there will always be a, a majority of people who are willing, able, and excited about the option to think out of the box. I always say there is 40% who just want to have a good paid job and they'll just fill out the forms and move on. But there is a majority of people who are actually willing to have an impact on society. We as law professors and, and, and as those who design curriculum, let's be honest, this is not just an individual enterprise, this is a school and institutional enterprise of sorts. As long as we are encouraging this and not actively hampering it, as long as we're giving the opportunity, I think we're on the right track. But again, as I said before, we will fail miserably many times before we get on a course that actually leads somewhere better. But I think there is, a, in, you know, ultimately there is a better goal. That's what I think. Yeah, and, and you, as a law professor, you keep that in your mind and you enable people who are taking the right approach to it, you're having an effect on them. So uh, Chang, you have the opportunity to, uh, to disagree with Alexander. We're talking about critical thinking. How much of what he said do you agree with? I agree with everything Alexander said, except he, <laughs> I should, you all of you should listen to me. No, I think we should. <laughs> let me quote President Obama: "The future belongs to the young people." And the, the as uh, Alexander correctly pointed, that the vast majority, not all of them, but the vast majority of the young people, they are uh, idealistic, they are open-minded, they are global, they are practical, and they are committed. And just like the the, uh, the owner of the world, you look at the United States, the vast majority of the country agree with gun control. The vast majority of country agree with uh, uh, the Green New Deal. The vast majority of country agree with Obamacare. And the reason we have a fake debate in, in Washington is because the young people are not in charge. So once the young people are in, are in charge, I think things will change. You know, I can imagine one of the one of the best things about teaching law is that years later, you see one of your own students who is promising at the time and who you enable, and he's in public office, and he's in Washington or wherever, and you write him a note and you say, "Good job." You're, you're maintaining the standards that we talked about. That must be very gratifying to have that opportunity. Anyway, uh, Chang Wang. Uh, Alexander Morava, thank you very much, gentlemen, for this discussion. Uh, I know we will continue it. Aloha. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.